The opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. Welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sutter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. A prosperous and growing economy benefits us all, and understanding the ways in which government laws and regulations can either encourage or discourage growth is one of the most fundamental questions economists attempt to answer in our research. One of the most important sources for growth in the, an economy are entrepreneurs, the people with ideas for new goods and services who build the new businesses that improve our lives. Does government regulation stifle entrepreneurship, as some economists claim? And might there be more than one type of entrepreneurship, which can complicate these matters even further? Joining me on, e uh, on e conversations today to talk about some of his recent research exploring the connections between regulation and entrepreneurship is Dr. John Dove, the Manuel H. Johnson Professor of Economics with the Johnson Center at Troy University. Well, welcome back to the show, John. Thanks again for having me, Dan. Well, your, your paper starts off from the uh, assumption, or, or I guess the recognition that entrepreneurship is really important for our growing and prosperous economy. But uh, tell us a little bit, like, these are some guys uh, that, that would be uh, um, well-known entrepreneurs today, but tell us a little bit, like when economists talk about entrepreneurship and this role that it plays in the economy, what exactly are, are we referring to here? Yeah, it's really kind of thinking about entrepreneurship as a, as a discovery process. You know, we, we all know that, you know, well, one thing that we definitely know about the future is that it's uncertain, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the purpose and function of an entrepreneur is to really kind of think through that uncertainty and to try to, you know, determine or, or, or figure out, you know, where are things headed and what is it that people are going to want in the future, right? Mm -hmm. Many times there are things that people don't even know right now that they're going to want, but it's right. that perceptive individual, the individual that we call the entrepreneur, who goes out, tries to discover these things, and then take scarce resources and compile them and put them together in meaningful ways, right? ways that ultimately produce things that you and I want. And as economists, when we study this, we really like to distinguish between the new and the stuff that's already existing, because I mean, you, you can approach those questions about, well, should we do more of what we already know that we're doing and, and is profitable versus something new and untried? Those, those, those are very different uh, questions, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, in a way, it's kind of this sort of distinction between innovation and invention in, in a lot of contexts, right? Where, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, many times, right, they, they innovate on, on what already exists, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we can think about somebody like Henry Ford, right, who, you know, he, he didn't actually invent the automobile, that had already existed. But what he did was figure out, he innovated on, on a new way and a new method to actually produce the automobile. Mm -hmm. and in fact, he, he ultimately right, uh, uh, led to mass production right, with the right. assembly line. And you know, in so doing, we can actually look at you know, how much that ultimately improved the human condition, which is really what successful entrepreneurs ultimately do, right, is figure out, again, those things that individuals many times don't even know that they want mm -hmm. and then produce them and, and thereby um, um, increase overall well-being, right, where we can see that after, after the uh, uh, invention or the, the discovery and the, the creation of the assembly line for, for automobiles, right, the price of an automobile plummeted. Mm -hmm. now, clearly that has real ramifications for all individuals and especially relatively poor individuals. And the, the, in, in Ford's case, that was part of what he was banking on. He thought that there could actually be a mass market for, for automobiles as opposed to it being a, a plaything for, for wealthy, the wealthy in America and, I guess, Europe at the time, right? That's exactly right. And that's, that's the situation that you were ultimately faced with was prior to Henry Ford doing what he did, the automobile really was just a luxury for you know, the, the, the tippy top of, of the income distribution and only just the extremely wealthy after him many people, many ordinary individuals could afford a car. 
And, and so economists who have been who thought you know, probably the most are best known for you know, their, their thinking about and, and uh, theorizing the role of entrepreneurship in, in the economy really do emphasize this like the, the new or different part of, of, of this entrepreneurial conjecture about what might or might not work, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Again, it just kind of gets back to that whole idea of entrepreneurship as, as a discovery process, you know, really trying the, the untested and the, and the unknown, really trying to understand and discover where is it that this, this unknown future is headed to, and then ultimately trying to create those things that, that, that they anticipate individuals will want. Again, it does not necessarily mean that they're ultimately going to be successful, right, but that's what they try to do. And through that process. And, and for our economy as a whole, when we refer to this as a discovery process, a part of what we're also learning is stuff that doesn't work, right? And, 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 and because most uh, new products, most uh, new ideas don't end up uh, I improving our, our lives, and, and so they end up getting tried and, and axed, right? That's exactly right. And that's why you know, a system of, of profit and loss is so important. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, all profit and loss are, they're simply signals, right? Profit signals to, to current or would-be entrepreneurs, look, whatever you're doing, however you're taking those scarce resources and combining them, keep doing that, right? It signals that because it's saying that you and I, we actually want those products, mm -hmm. right? If, if we didn't, well, then it wouldn't be profitable. And what that means is then, right, it incentivizes other individuals to go out and try those things or try to improve on what's being done. On the flip side, right, again, there's no guarantee that any entrepreneurship, right, Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, any of those, there was no guarantee that any one of them would be successful. And that's the flip side, right, the signal, the equally important signal of loss, right, uh, uh, taking an economic loss, right, which indicates that, look, individuals don't want these products made. We don't mm -hmm. want you taking these scarce resources and combining them in the way that you're doing it. Stop doing it free up those resources or figure out a better way to do what you're doing. And, and figuring out a big, better way is, is sometimes an important thing because you can try something and it, it doesn't succeed and it's not immediately obvious why it didn't succeed. Was it something that consumers simply didn't want at all and or for any price or, or was there simply some kind of I know, problem with executing your, your, or carrying out your vision, right? That's exactly right. You know, a great example of that would be the iPad, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that you know, what was it, maybe the mid-2000s is when the first iPad came out. That's not true. It was actually, I think, 1993. It was the Apple Newton. It was effectively the very first iPad. And guess what? You know, it sold in 1993 for somewhere around $800, right, which in today's dollars is significantly more. Mm -hmm. right? Nobody wanted it. So what happened? Well, it exited the market, right? Apple took it off the market. It was not successful, right? It took another, you know, 15 years for technology to develop, for prices to fall, and for people to finally realize and see, oh, this is a very convenient technology to actually have. Mm -hmm. You know, we, uh, the vision, you know, the pictures I had up there earlier were of a famous uh, individual entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurship, especially once the, the economists think about this role of it, uh, with the, the emphasizing the new or the different uh, new products, new services, new ways of organizing economic activity, that can also occur within existing firms, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, they're just, just, just as though, or uh, just like you can have an individual who acts entrepreneurially, right? Yeah, within firms, you can have the exact same thing, right? Individuals trying to discover uh, uh, new products to put onto the market within those firms or firms themselves, right? The, mm -hmm. the profit and loss system, right? Those signals, right, are just as strong on firms as they are to the individual entrepreneur. I mean, think about, you know, all of the major all the major producers out there now, all, all, the, all the new products that they're constantly trying to put onto the market, right? Again, there's no guarantee that those products are going to be desirable in any way, right? In fact, we see many, many times there are lots of new products that end up in the market that are pretty promptly taken off the market, right? I mean, new right. Coke is a great example mm -hmm. of that. You know, we that Coca-Cola tried something new, nobody wanted it. In fact, people hated it, right? Coca-Cola had to apologize. <laughs> Right, as a result of that. But that shows the importance of this process and allowing that process to occur. And it also shows the importance of you know, how, how uncertain the future can be. And no matter who you are, you can screw it up at any given time. Even Coca-Cola can screw something like that up. Now, when we look at some of the new businesses that have emerged in our uh, economy, like Amazon, Walmart from a few years prior to that, uh, uh, Facebook, 
these companies are, are not only making our lives better off, but by <coughs> bringing new products, new services to the market, they're also providing jobs for millions of people, I mean, jobs that are connected to these businesses that are creating value. And so, I mean, the, the, this end product is enormously important. To, I mean, it sort of like shows just how valuable this is for our prosperous economy. That's exactly right. I mean, that's that's ultimately the function that that entrepreneurship serves is to find those products, to discover those products that you know people people want, right? And in so doing, when you and I go out and purchase those products, as a result, that entrepreneur becomes successful, right? It grows. It also incentivizes other individuals to try to enter that market and other mm -hmm. businesses to enter that market to produce similar things or find better ways to produce those things. And in so doing, leads to all sorts of job creation and job growth and ultimately economic growth. Now, one of the important questions that uh, for, for economics is, is whether the economic, whether government policies <laughs> as a whole can either in uh, inhibit or promote uh, uh, entrepreneurship. So if you could tell us a little bit, like, why is it that like government uh, regulations might harm or, or, or restrict uh, entrepreneurs? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that these are issues that, that really kind of go back to Adam Smith, right? He, he's talked about a lot of this, you know, how, how it is that, that tax policy can, can affect economic activity and, and, and entrepreneurial activity, right? The, the regulatory environment that exists, right? What you ultimately want, right, out of any sort of regulatory environment is a level playing field, right? It's something, something that's equally applied to, to all individuals or all businesses, right? And something that's knowable, okay? And you mm -hmm. also want something that isn't overly onerous, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we can think about it like this. You know, you look at uh, a country like New Zealand, right? And this, this is an issue that you see, you know, around the world. And you also see many instances in the U.S., right, in, in New Zealand, right? In order to, to, to start a new business and register a new business, it takes a day. And, you know, it costs ultimately a couple hundred dollars to register that business. What does that mean? Effectively, the next day, you can start being an entrepreneur. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're going to be successful but you have that opportunity, right? You can mm -hmm. look at a country like the Congo, on the other hand, where typically it can take upwards of three months to just register a business, legally register a business, right? And it can cost 700% of annual income. Well, now again, where is it that individuals are gonna start, start businesses, start acting as entrepreneurs in New Zealand? Well, we can also look here in the US too and try to analyze, especially at the state level, what sort of differences do we have in the regulatory environment that might actually influence or affect that entrepreneurial activity? Now, if we're going to uh, attempt to investigate this empirically, to try to either confirm or that the government regulation could be uh, inhibiting a regular uh, entrepreneurship, one issue we are, we're going to face is how do we actually measure entrepreneurship? We've talked about, and economists have laid out like theoretically what functions or what roles econ mm -hmm. entrepreneurship plays in the economy. But if we want to be able to actually sort of say like, oh, here the government enacted this regulation and we had less entrepreneurship as a result afterwards, we first have to have some way to measure entrepreneurship. So tell us right. a little bit about how uh, economists go about th this very important uh, task of, of coming up with something that might measure entrepreneurship. Sure, yeah, and that's, you know, that's a really tough question too, is uh, how, how you actually go about doing something like that, especially when there are all sorts of you know, theories about what it is that entrepreneurship does. Well, it's nice to have theory, but we also want to try to test those theories too, mm -hmm. right? And so that's where this really comes, comes into play. But you know, trying to look at how we can measure entrepreneurship, you know, some individuals have used um, you know, business startups, just looking at mm -hmm. the total number of business startups, or maybe you know, startups uh, that employ up to a certain number of people, um, you know, for, for relatively smaller startups or larger startups, right? You could also look at uh, payroll data has also been used. Um, you can also look at things like uh, net, net firm or net business formation, which is mm -hmm. effectively, you know, the difference between business startups and business deaths because, right, while we have situations where new businesses start, Right, there are lots of businesses that also go out of business. Right? Mm -hmm. So what's kind of the, the difference between those two? Right, those are some of the, the, the bigger measures that we have. Again, there's no perfect way to actually cut at this, but you know, what we're ultimately trying to do is, is refine it as much as possible in a manner that, that gets us as close to this approximation of what would entrepreneur entrepreneurship actually be as we can. Right, and, and one of the things 
we were missing out there in the regards just like any measure of how entrepreneurial existing firms, especially large firms, happen to be. Are, are they entrepreneurial or are they bureaucratic? Are, are they doing new and different things or, or do they just, uh, are, are the people within those firms completely stifled by r rules uh, that, that those uh, firms impose on them? Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's, that's one of the toughest ones right there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just, just a good example to, to kind of cut at your idea there is, you know, you can think about, you know, General Motors at its peak. You know, one of one of the kind of running jokes about General Motors was it, because it was so large, right, that, that GM could kick itself in its own butt and would take a week before its brain actually knew what was going on, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, you look at a you look at a, a a company like that, and because it is so large, it mostly just becomes a bureaucracy where it's very hard to actually see innovative change, right? And you know, as a result of that, that's why we started to see. You know, companies like Honda, Hyundai, Toyota really mm -hmm. start to take large chunks of market share from GM. So we have this measure of, of uh, various versions of like new business formation that m that might work, but then there there's an issue. Is first of a, a paradox that sort of uh, arises as economists are, are trying to look at uh, business, uh, you know, this m business formation as a measure of entrepreneurship, and that's the fact that when a recession hits entrepreneurship seems to go up and, right. and that, that that strikes some people as, as puzzling that's exactly right and that's that's actually something that for quite some time did perplex e economists and also uh, scholars uh, within entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurship literature uh, at large was it really was a consistent empirical fact that when you tried to look at entrepreneurship entrepreneurship rose during recessions now that's not something that is actually supposed to happen, especially if we think of entrepreneurship as, as being you know, growth enhancing and growth oriented, right? Something that's mm -hmm. supposed to be occurring when times are good, when there right. are actual opportunities out there, when people have additional extra income to spend on new products and new innovative things. But all of a sudden we get this weird situation where for whatever reason, right, entrepreneurship seems to be growing during recessions. And that's led to some ideas to both from a theoretical standpoint and then an empirical standpoint to refine how it is we're, we've been measuring uh, entrepreneurship. So tell us a little bit about this distinction that, that's come up about entrepreneur, uh, opportunity and, and the necessity of entrepreneurship. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's kind of you know, where the scholarship really is right now is to try to make that distinction mm -hmm. and to recognize that you know, there are different types of entrepreneurship, right? And so just as you're saying, right, the kind of the, the, the two big types that are the two dichotomies that people see uh, would be uh, uh, the difference between opportunity and necessity entrepreneurship, right? Where necessity entrepreneurship is the entrepreneurship that is associated with recessions, mm -hmm. right? We can think of that as being a situation where, you know, I've lost my job, right? The, the economy's tanked, I've lost my job. You know, I've been out searching for a new job, you know, for, for months now, nothing's come along. Well, what's kind of my last ditch effort to actually at least get myself employed again? Well, I'll start working out of my home, mm -hmm. right? That, that would be kind of your necessity entrepreneurship. If times were actually good, I would not be acting as an entrepreneur. I would actually rather be working for somebody else. That's how we think about necessity entrepreneurship. And that's really where the, the, the rise in entrepreneurship that, that was observed initially uh, in the empirical literature came from versus mm -hmm. opportunity entrepreneurship. Right, which is that entrepreneurship that is associated with growth-oriented opportunities and the pro-cyclicality pro of the business cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, just because this whole, whole idea is, if if you think you've got a, a you know business idea like Uber or Amazon that might really transform the economy and, and generate a lot of opportunity, uh, generate a lot of new growth and, and new business. I mean, again, that, that's probably not a recession or, or the, the depths of a, a recession is probably not the time in which you're going to want to really experiment on something like completely new and, and completely untried, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's just intuitive. I mm -hmm. think that anybody can, can understand and see that, that when, when real, true entrepreneurial opportunities and, and come about and when, when entrepreneurship really occurs and emerges is when you know the economy is growing and, and is in a good state right when the economy is in recession right typically we don't see those same opportunities emerge and and so if if we do have a lot of you know on, uh, uh, necessity entrepreneurship or you know, like say cupcake uh, bakeries uh, clothing stores uh, that they get open simply because 
somebody's lost their job or they, they moved with a spouse and they don't, can't find anything else to do, so they're, they're going to open a, a small business. Those businesses aren't necessarily intended to, to grow a lot. And they, again, they aren't that necessarily these things connected with like really new ideas in, in, in the economy, right? That's exactly right. And that's, that's really the big distinction, too, is just this idea of you know, what sort of entrepreneurial activity is, is growth oriented. Mm -hmm. And that's really trying to understand then this concept of opportunity entrepreneurship. Those, those entrepreneurial opportunities and activities that really will lead to economic growth and development. And again, we want to be able to see if, if like red tape, if, if uh, regulation, and probably because we could think of both um, taxes, which could take away the profit that uh, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs might be able to make, and then also regulations, sort of like limiting uh, people's freedom to, to do new and different things uh, right. that, that could both uh, affect things. But yeah, I think there are probably uh, economists might believe that uh, having to get permission or, or, or regulatory burdens could be more significant, uh, maybe especially on new pro new businesses than than uh, taxes per se, especially at least the range in which we see business taxes. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, I think that uh, when it comes to when it comes to things like tax policy, right, there is a lot of competition between states. It tends mm -hmm. to it tends to level out between states more or less, I think, on net. And again, you, you get outliers, you get places like, you know, Texas versus California is a, a, an example that a lot of people like to, to use and to compare where, you know, a lot of businesses do seem to be exiting California on some margins and entering Texas. Mm -hmm. But again, the reg regulatory environment is another area, right, where, you know, we can see, you know, many of these differences emerge as well. Um, again, right at the state level, you know, on, on a number of margins, right there, there is competition, mm -hmm. obviously over over the overall regulatory burden that that one state imposes, right? We don't necessarily see massive outliers because, again, if that was the case, then businesses really would, you know, leave that environment. But you know, I think that one area where we can try to look at, and this is ultimately what I tried to do with with the research that I looked at, was you know, how does the impact of federal regulation across states actually affect entrepreneurial activity because the interesting thing is is you know federal regulation actually impacts states in different ways and on different margins right just depending on you know the nature of the state or the nature of the regulation yeah. there's nothing that's 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 uniform about that so yeah so so to get into specifically what you're trying to do in your research was you, know, you wanted to zoom in or focus in on opportunity entrepreneurship and then uh, the federal regulatory burden and so mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the, uh, the the measure that you're using for this opportunity entrepreneurship this idea of trying to get down to those those drill down to these biz the types of businesses that might really reflect these like brand new ideas these growth creating uh, prosperity creating uh, uh, mm -hmm. ideas uh, that entrepreneurs might have. Yeah, and as you have up here, you know the Kaufman Foundation. It's it's a foundation that's been a while for around or been a while for around now, been around for a while now, and you know they've they've developed an, a number of uh, measures of entrepreneurship and just try to look at you know what effect does entrepreneurship actually have on an economy. Mm -hmm. That's that's really their main goal, and so one uh, measure that they developed is the their their uh, index of startup activity, mm -hmm. right? Which is what I'm looking at here, which is broken down between opportunity and necessity entrepreneurship. So, you know, they actually have a way of trying to to tease out and cut at this concept of opportunity entrepreneurship and broadly. Right? They actually use um, data from the uh, uh, current population survey. And why that's nice is because what they can do is actually observe right, specifically when an individual starts a new, by the, starts a new business right, at, mm -hmm. at that point in time and so can, can build you know, a long run uh, measure of this. And simultaneously, it also does not re rely on payroll data and it does not rely on incorporation data which is you know, kind of a, a shortcoming of a number of measures of entrepreneurship simply because there are many, many entrepreneurs out there who don't hire people, mm -hmm. so they have no payroll, and also they don't incorporate, so by those measures they wouldn't actually be counted. So what we have here based on this measure is a much more broad uh, understanding of what sort of entrepreneurial activities are actually going on okay. um, across states. And then you need some measure of regulatory activity and you, you, you yes. mentioned that you're going to focus in on the impact of federal regulations across mm -hmm. states so tell us a little bit about where you got this measure yeah so this is actually a, a new measure um, the the phrase index right from quant gov um, 
And this, this is, it goes back a number of years now, but what it actually tries to do is tease out what is the relative burden of federal regulations across states. Because mm -hmm. as we said, right, no federal regulation impacts two states exactly the same. Again, we can think about it just kind of intuitively, you know, an EPA regulation um, regarding the use or extraction of coal. Right? Mm -hmm. Clearly, that is going to have a much more significant impact on a state like West Virginia than it will a state like Alabama or Michigan. Mm -hmm. right? And so that's what this measure is trying to do, is understand how it is that each of these federal regulations actually ultimately impact states on a relative basis. Mm -hmm. and so that's what I've done, is to try to combine these two to see what effect then does this federal regulation actually have on opportunity on entrepreneurship across states. And, and you need that difference, you need that variation in the impact of regulation across states just to have some differences. One, one problem right. would be is that if you were just using a federal regulation without this tailored or, or estimated impact on, on the individual state, then you'd have one impact of a federal regulation equally across all states, so you have no variation in the level of, of regulation, right? That's exactly right, yep. And that's, that's why this is nice, is because you get, that, you get that variation, which then allows me to try to estimate what is the, the overall impact. And because when it comes down to doing empirical work, you really want to look at do differences in regulation cause differences in entrepreneurship. Exactly. So then tell us what you found. Yeah, so you know, overall, you know, a number of different estimates, and uh, pretty much across the board, it wasn't pretty much, it was across the board, what we find is that a, a greater relative regulatory burden uh, on, on a state negatively impacts opportunity entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I think that somewhere, uh, magnitude was somewhere along the lines of a 1% increase in the regu relative burden was around a 7% decrease in opportunity entrepreneurship within a state. That's a pretty significant difference and a pretty mm -hmm. significant change. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that, you know, a couple of things. Obviously, right, that, that, that regulation does matter for entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial activity. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, a, regu a, a federal regulation you know, does not impact any two states the same. Right, so it's really important to be mindful, especially when it comes to federal regulation, as to how it will actually impact different states in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe trying to, to tailor and adjust and account for some of those things and be more mindful of that. Yeah, because the, the one element of it being federal regulation is that it's not exactly like, when you look at states with the highest uh, regulatory burden in this, it's not something that like their state policymakers are, are doing to themselves necessarily. That's exactly right, and it could be a very could very well be a situation where you know at the state level that state may not actually even want that regulation, mm -hmm. and and that that could be an issue too. But regardless of, of where the regulation is coming from, we're in this process of trying to understand how regulation affects you know per, whether it does actually stifle entrepreneurship. This is really important to, uh, to be able to to look at this uh, to, to be able to link regulatory impacts uh, to entrepreneurship. Yeah, and that's exactly right, and that's that's what I've tried to do. That's what a number of scholars, additional scholars, have tried to do, and it's just continually refining this and finding new and different ways to measure it, new and different time periods. But you know, the nice thing is, it really does seem to be a, a consistent result overall that where we see a, a, a stricter and, and more burdensome. Uh, regulatory environment, it does have a negative effect on entrepreneurial activity. So, where might this uh, where might this research go in, in the future? Then, when you uh, you know, it's a it's a great question. I think that you know deeper dives into trying to understand maybe how regulatory environments within states mm -hmm. can affect this. Um, also, obviously, you know, this is ripe for research across countries, right? right. I'm, I'm simply just looking at states within the U.S., but this, this really does have a, a, a broader impact um, worldwide. Um, you know, again, the, like the example that I gave earlier between starting a business in New Zealand and starting a business in, in the Congo. It's not as if individuals living in the Congo are necessarily any less entrepreneurial or desirous of, of acting entrepreneurially as individuals in New Zealand. It's just that, you know, ultimately the incentives aren't necessarily there. And that's why getting the regulatory environment right is so fundamentally important because of the incentives or disincentives that it ultimately creates when it comes to pursuing these growth enhancing entrepreneurial activities. Well, thanks very much for joining us and telling about this. And, and thanks for joining us. Join us again next time for another e-conversations.